Good morning. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 31. Righteousness through faith. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. When then is boasting, it is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through the same faith, do we then nullify the law by his faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. Amen. Thanks, Heather, for reading scripture for us. You know, I was thinking back to the summer of 2019 uh, when Heather and I, a bunch of other adult leaders, uh, we're with some of our students from the Y Church on a trip that we took, leadership development trip to London and England. So we were there, incredible time following the footsteps of George Williams, the YMCA founder, and there to celebrate the 175th anniversary of the global YMCA. Part of our itinerary while we were there was heading up to Liverpool. So it was the first few days actually, we went right up to Liverpool where we spent some time and, and we were visiting different YMCAs and one of them took us to a rugby game. So it was an evening rugby match in the stadium in their professional league. And we were there cheering on the, the hometown team, the St. Helens Saints. And to this day, I still have no idea how the game of rugby actually works. I mean, we had a good time, but I, I mean, there was all kinds of things going on that I can't explain. Scrum and ruck and maul. I'm writing down these terms here as we go. Grubber kick and ankle tap and line out. There's this whole new vocabulary that I was trying to learn to the game of rugby. George Bernard Shaw said, Britain and the U.S. are two nations separated by a common language. And I think he had that about right. But, you know, there are games that we play here that we just know how they work by virtue of growing up here. So it's the same kind of thing. Games like football and baseball where you grow up with it and you just know the rules. Now, I wanna suggest that if there's something like the basic rules of biblical Christianity, then that is exactly what we have in this passage today. If you wanna understand what is at the heart of following Christ, then this is it. Romans 3. In fact, if you take just this paragraph in verses 21 to 26, that is what Martin Luther called the chief point and the very central place of the epistle and of the whole Bible, verses 21 to 26. And scholars ever since Luther have agreed on that point. Cranfield calls it the heart of the whole of Romans. So we're four weeks in, to studying this book of the Bible. We've got four more weeks to go, and then we'll, we'll call it good for the first half. We'll take a break for the spring and summer months, and then we'll come back in the fall and study the second half of Romans. And, and every week that we spend here, there are gonna be new treasures to discover and new things that will unfold. But what we look at today, this is truly the heart of it. If we don't get this, then we don't get anything else. It is that essential. In years past, I have met with confirmation students for one-on-one -on -one conversations. And, and when I meet with them, I would ask three questions. There'd be more questions, but really three core questions that we would dialogue about. So we'd be at 
cherry berry or caribou, someplace like that. And I would ask our students these questions. Why do you want to be confirmed? Secondly, what is the gospel? And thirdly, what does the gospel mean for your life now and for when you die? And I wonder if, if we could have that conversation here. You know, if you had the cherry berry in your hands or the, the latte, uh, how would you respond? Would you be able to respond to answer those questions with some measure of confidence? These questions are so critical, as are the verses that we're looking at today in Romans. These are the basics. This is the foundation. And it might look and feel like some, some big words are in there and long sentences, but God's word is not meant to remain mysterious for us. He wants us to know these things and he'll make it clear as we study and as we ask him for help. So let's do that together. Let's, let's pray as we begin our study that the Lord would help us. Lord, we desire to know you. We desire to know truth and to live according to it. But beyond that, Lord, there's something in us that just longs to know the assurance of our salvation. That, that we would know that we're not lost, that our life has direction and purpose and it matters, and that we belong to you now and forever. And so, Lord, would you make these things clear to us in your word? Would you teach us and lead us? We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Verses 21 to 26, that will be our focus. And believe it or not, it is one single sentence in the original Greek. So in English composition class, you would get in a lot of trouble for something like that, this huge run-on sentence. But in Greek, it was just the opposite. The longer the sentence, the better the writing. And here's what Paul is writing about. He's writing about justification by faith. And it was this discovery of Martin Luther that set him free from the torment of sin and judgment and condemnation. It was this discovery that unleashed the corrective force of the Reformation in the church, justification by faith. And, and if you're not quite sure what that phrase means, we're going to give it definition in a minute and really throughout the message this morning. But what, what set Luther free was spending time in the Bible and spending time reading the book of Romans. In chapter 1, he read Romans 1.17. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written. The righteous will live by faith. That summary statement of Paul from chapter 1 is what's elaborated on now here in chapter 3, verses 21 to 26, this one sentence. But in between, in between 117 and 321, where we are now, we had that whole block from 118 to 320. And we just scratched the surface of it last week. And that whole block really describes our need to be justified, to be declared righteous before God. And so last week, we talked about the wrath of God, and we gave it its proper definition. The wrath of God is a clear biblical teaching, but it's so different than our human caricature of, of what wrath looks like. You know, hot-headed, vindictive, out of control. That's not the wrath of God. No, God's wrath is the necessary reaction of his perfect holiness to the ugly reality of our sin. That God, who is the definition of goodness and justice and beauty, he cannot ignore sin or wrong or moral evil. And so just as we have this internal sense of right and wrong and what it means to pay for a mistake or to have a penalty for a crime. Uh, this is just the way that it works. And it's, it's hardwired into us. If there's an offense, there's reparation. In basketball, you know, you can't body check a guy into the bleachers and then dribble down and make a basket. 
I, no, that's that's a foul that you have committed. There's a penalty for that. And and when when you're at the gas station, you know you can't fill up your vehicle and then just decide to drive off without paying. They they, they don't really like that. They're probably going to come and find you. Uh, if you're a parent, you know the the sense of having to discipline your children and and give a consequence. There are things that have to be set right. We know this. And this is because we're made in the image of God. We're this little imperfect reflection of his perfect character. So these are the things that we talked about last week, if you remember. When we reject the truth of God, we rightly incur his wrath. There is a penalty for sin. There's consequence. And what Luther agonized over before reading Romans is how he could ever be sure that he'd paid enough for his sin. You know, was his consequence over? Was he being good enough now? How could he know that the wrath of God wasn't still upon him? And then he read Romans 3.21. But now. And Martin Lloyd-Jones said, there are no more wonderful words in the whole of scripture than just these two words, but now. These words are the continental divide between the time of sin's dominion and now the time of salvation. In 321, we step out of God's wrath and we step into his righteousness. Paul says, but now, apart from the law the righteousness of God has been made known. Now, there's a helpful little summary that John Stott, this wonderful British theologian, has for this passage. He asks the question, what does the righteousness of God mean? And then pay special attention to how he answers, especially the verbs. Number one, the righteousness of God is the status which God requires if we are ever able to stand before him. Number two, it is that which God achieves through the atoning sacrifice of his son. Three, it is that which is revealed in the gospel. And four, it is that which God bestows freely on all who trust in Jesus. So did you catch those verbs? Requires, achieves, revealed, bestows. That's the righteousness of God. Paul says this righteousness is is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. And that's the gospel right there. The righteousness of God is these four things. It is given and not earned. It's through faith, not through any good deeds that we would do. It's through faith in Jesus Christ, not in anything else. And finally, it's given to all who believe. There is no select club. Remember what, what Luther said, I quoted this a couple of weeks ago, when this hit him, when he truly understood the gospel, do you remember what he said? Night and day I pondered until I grasped the truth that the righteousness of God is that righteousness whereby through grace and sheer mercy, he justifies us by faith. Thereupon I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. That is what the gospel does. It sets you free from sin and into open doors and paradise you go. This is the good news that was being proclaimed in Rome, in the capital city of the empire. And all kinds of people from different walks of life are hearing this and are coming to faith in Christ. One of the biggest distinctions among them was probably this one. That is that some of them were Jewish and some were not. And the Jewish word for those who were not is the word Gentile. And it is this Gentile Jewish dynamic in the church that really led to a great amount of tension. And if left unchecked, it could amount to, to discord and division in the church. That's why after Paul says, to all who believe, he says this, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is a Bible memory verse right there. It's a summary of everything that we read in that big section from 118 to 320, and that's it in a nutshell, Romans 323. All have sinned 
and fall short of the glory of God. And fall short is a present tense verb, meaning it has the sense of regularly falling short. I continually fall short of God's glory. You know, I might try and, and try to get it right like Luther did, but I just keep coming up short and it's never going to be enough. How will I know if I'm ever enough? They say that there are two distinct halves to the presidency of Lyndon B. Johnson. He became president, of course, when JFK was assassinated. So he was vice president. And then all of a sudden, very tragically, he was the president. But Lyndon Johnson rose to the moment. He brought reassurance to the nation. And then he began one of the most transformative legislative seasons in the history of this country. It started with tax reduction, then the Civil Rights Act of 1964, then the Clean Air Act. Then just a year after Kennedy's assassination, Johnson won the regularly scheduled election by a landslide. And then he worked with the 89th Congress as arguably the most productive Congress in American history. The creation of Medicare, Social Security Reform, the Voting Rights Act, Higher Education Act, the Freedom of Information Act, Public Works and Economic Development, a National Foundation for the Arts, Public Broadcasting, Housing and Urban Development, Immigration, and the list goes on. This was all part of what was called the Great Society. And Lyndon Johnson was at the top of his game, at the top of the world, until what? Until Vietnam. Vietnam was his undoing. He was great at domestic affairs. And so as long as his attention was here, he was hitting home runs, but he did not know how to handle the war. And LBJ fell completely out of favor with the people. In fact, uh, he did not even seek his party's nomination and did not run for re-election in 1968. Instead, he retreated to his hometown in rural Texas, there out on a ranch, and uh, his childhood home was turned into a museum. And there in the waning years of his life, he could be found checking the variety of license plates in the parking lot and checking the weekly attendance records to try and get some kind of measure of how much people still liked him. You can measure, 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 but you will always fall short. What we need is a new rubric, a new reality. And that's what we get in verse 24. Paul says, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Now in that line, there's two word pictures that Paul is using here that we would miss as non-Greek speakers and not from Greco-Roman culture. But the original readers would have instantly picked up what Paul was alluding to. The two words are justified and redemption. The first is a word from the courtroom. The second is a word from the slave market, two fixtures in the Greco-Roman culture. Now, so you have to imagine uh, they, they would hear justified and they are thinking of a judge who is hearing a case and then delivering the verdict and saying, justified. Then I don't know if they'd pound the gavel or not, if they had that in their world, but they would say, justified. This person is in the right. I am making my ruling and I'm declaring this one righteous. And then the other word that Paul uses is redemption, which we remember from our recent study in the book of Ruth, the kinsman redeemer, Boaz, bought back, redeemed Ruth. In Paul's day, the context would have been the slave market. Estimates for Rome suggest that one third of the population of Rome, the capital city, were slaves. And if you counted in all those who at some point in their life had been slaves, it was probably two thirds of all the people of Rome uh, knew something of slavery. The slave market and the purchasing of people was common language for them. And so Paul says, we have been purchased out of slavery to sin 
and our redemption came by Christ Jesus. Listen to how Paul, uh, listen to how John Bunyan, almost said Paul Bunyan, listen to how John Bunyan described what happened in his life when he read this verse. This is from his autobiography, which is called Grace Abounding. He said, as I was walking up and down in the house as a man in a most woeful state, that word of God took hold of my heart. Quote, you are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, Romans 3.24. And he says, but oh, what a turn it made upon me. Now was I as one awakened out of some troublesome sleep and dream and listening to this heavenly sentence. It was as if I had heard it thus. Sinner, you think that because of your sins and infirmities, I cannot save your soul. But behold, my son is by me, and upon him I look, and not on you. And I will deal with you as I am pleased with him. We hit a new milestone at our house this year with our daughters. For the first time, they came home from school and they said, Dad, Mom, we switched places. And I looked at them and I said, what? You, you switched places? They said, yeah. You know, we switched spots in class. Now, many of you know that our daughters are identical twins. And so think parent trap or something like that. They're sixth graders now. And they go to this little parochial school that's up near us. And, and then they're sharing the details with me that they did this in religion class with the pastor as the teacher. Now, I did my best to look sternly at them, but inside I was like, yes, <laughs> well done. There is a switch that I want to describe here that happens at the cross. The word that often is used is a double imputation. And here's what that means. My sin switches places and it goes from me to Christ. And in exchange, his righteousness that he has switches places and goes to me. Imagine putting on a nice expensive coat you know, one that you have no business even looking at. You're, you're in a store that is out of your league, but you're putting on this nice expensive coat and it's yours to wear and to have. We sing about this as an, in an old hymn that has been redone recently. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone faultless to stand before the throne. It's an imputation of righteousness. And Paul continues and says, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. And here he uses a third word picture for his readers. We had the courtroom, the slave market, and now he references the temple. Now, what our Bible translates as a sacrifice of atonement is the Greek word hilasterion. The only other place this word appears in the New Testament is Hebrews 9, 5, where it says, above the ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. And there it is at the end, atonement cover, hilasterion. So it makes sense that we would see this word a lot in the Old Testament where we have the Ark of the, the Covenant. The atonement cover was part of the Ark, and the Ark was this gold-covered wooden chest where God manifested his presence with his people. It was the visible sign. You know, this is not like God is confined to a box, but, but this is God communicating to his people, I am with you. I go with you. You are my people. And so they would, would carry around the Ark of the Covenant, and put it in the tabernacle, and later it had a permanent home in the temple. And the lid of that wooden chest was called the atonement cover, or the mercy seat. And above the lid stretched the wings of the two cherubim, these two angels. And this is where 
the blood of a bull and a goat was sprinkled by the high priest once a year on the day of atonement. Atonement is the reparation of wrong or injury, or in this case, sin. It's that word atonement. So on the day of atonement, it is all about forgiveness. And this day of atonement would happen year after year. And a bull and a goat were sacrificed and the blood is sprinkled on, on the, the mercy seat. But it was never a permanent fix. So I want you to take all these thoughts and, and put them together. Atonement, mercy seat, imputation. And then let's read this again. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood, of his blood. The writer of Hebrews says it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. We are stuck in this mess of sin and death, this, this cycle that we're in. And so God, God sent his son to atone for our sin once and for all in a way that we never could down here by giving his life in our place on the cross. It has been called the great exchange. Our sins are laid on Christ and his righteousness is laid on us. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Well, time is running short now, and we'll draw this to a close here. Paul's written this whole section to say essentially this. Faith is the only basis by which we are declared righteous before God. That's what you have to understand as we study this word today. We are justified by faith alone in Christ alone. It is the cross or it is nothing. A couple weeks ago, Esther and I finally did something that we've been thinking about for a little while. We put a cross up on the wall above our bed where for 16 years we have had these three pictures, three black and white wedding photos that, that we've had wherever we li have lived. We've had these three pictures up there, but for some reason we just felt led in this, this past year to, to change it up and specifically to put a cross above our bed. And so now when I go to bed at night and I, and I hop, hop in and, and I, I look up, I, I just, instantly see this cross that is there above me and and often it's you know so it's dark in the room but the the curtains might be open a little bit and the moonlight is flooding in and I can see this cross and every time I, I see it I have this certain song this old song that runs through my my head and, and before I tell you what the song is I want to tell you about who wrote it her name was Elizabeth Clifane she lived in Scotland in the 1800s where she grew up in Melrose which was a, a small little town south of Edinburgh. And Elizabeth is described as a, a very quiet child. She shied away from attention. She loved books. She's also described as being in really quite poor health for a little girl. On top of that, her parents died when she was young, leaving her familiar with many sorrows. And yet Elizabeth, as she was growing in years, she had this nickname the sunbeam of Melrose. Because though she was shy, she had and had experienced such hardship, she had such a cheery disposition and, and this selfless spirit about her. She could often be found in town helping the poor or serving those with disabilities. That, that's where they would find her. On one occasion, she and her sisters, as they were older, they decided to sell their horse and carriage in order to take that money and give it to a family in need. Elizabeth was considered an excellent listener. She was a diligent student of the Bible and a worker among the poor, even though her health was so frail. And yet, what did this woman accomplish in her life? What did she amount to? What license plates and, and attendance records did she have to show for? Well, not much. Elizabeth died at the age of 38. 
and she is known for having written two hymns, two hymns that we have from her. And one of them is this, beneath the cross of Jesus, I fain would take my stand, the shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land, a home within the wilderness, a rest upon the way from the burning of the noontide heat and the burden of the day. I take, O cross, thy shadow for my abiding place. I ask no other sunshine than the sunshine of his face. Content to let the world go by, to know no gain nor loss. My sinful self, my only shame, my glory, all the cross. Let's pray together. Lord, you have been so good and merciful to us. I pray for each of us who are listening, that your cross would truly be our resting place, where it all gets sorted out, where our sin is lifted, where our hearts are cleansed and comforted, and where your righteousness, Lord, settles on us as the mantle of your love. We thank you, Lord, for this gift. We receive it. We place all our trust in you and in what you have accomplished for us at the cross. And I pray, Lord, for anyone listening now who has any doubt about their standing before you, that today and from now on, they would know the full assurance of their salvation and your love for them in Christ for all eternity. We praise and worship you alone. Amen.